For those of you I don't know, my name is Don Elliman, and I have the honor of being the Chancellor of the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. And I mean that when I say it's an honor. It's the uh, best job I've ever had in my life, and I, I love every minute of it. This is the second in our series of this year of transforming healthcare, and the, uh, the subject uh, today is new frontiers in mental health. Um, four years ago, we, and by we I mean this campus, the CU Andrews campus, made a, a conscious decision uh, to transform our role in mental health in the state of Colorado. Uh, prior to that, we had been largely focused on research and education, uh, teaching new psychiatrists, uh, but we were relatively light in the field of, of care itself in the community. Um, and we, we we're lucky we started a three-step plan to try to change that. Uh, step one of which was to hire a woman named Neil Epperson, who came in as the depart department chair in psychiatry. And you're going to hear a, a, some words from Neil later today. But she came in with a the, the mindset of totally revamping the way we looked at mental health care in the state of Colorado. And you're going to hear something quite a bit about that later. One aspect of that is in the four years that she's been here, we've increased the number of lives we've touched every year by 400%. So it's, it's really the decision to take an active role in clinical care was something that we believed in and Neil has, has executed and, and transformed that. Step number, number that was step number two. Step number one was recruiting Neil. Step number two was going aggressively in clinical care. And step number three was looking toward innovation. Uh, because, you know, the one thing that's pretty obvious about the, the mental health crisis or pandemic that we're in, I think it's really a, a pandemic and in some ways a pandemic that uh, has a greater economic impact than even the one that we've just found our way through or are finding our way through COVID. The one thing that we know for sure is that we can't clinic our way out of the problem. There will never be enough providers in the foreseeable future to deal with all the people who need help in mental health in the traditional sense as we deliver it today. So what was required was a, a, a look at innovation and creative solutions to that problem. And that's what you're going to hear about today. Uh, to kick it off, uh, let me introduce Dr. Jay Shore, who will be your MC tonight. Um, Jay is the newly named Vice Chair for Innovations in the Department of Psychiatry. And he's a great choice for that because he is a world leader in telemedicine in mental health uh, and has really been involved in technology for over a decade. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jay Shore. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending tonight. We're excited to have you. I'm Jay Shore, and I'm honored to be uh, the new vice chair for innovations for the Department of Psychiatry and part of a set of amazing teams and projects in our department. I'd like to thank Chancellor Elliman uh, for all his support in the last few years of innovations on the Anschutz campus, and especially in the Department of Psychiatry, as we bring together a new phase in innovations work. I need to acknowledge uh, Dr. Neil Epperson's dynamic leadership in galvanizing innovations, both in a role as chair, but also leading important work in innovations, several projects which we'll hear of tonight. As Chancellor Elliman said, we're currently facing an unprecedented mental health challenge, but there is a wealth of evolving knowledge and tools that can help us take these challenges on. We're emerging from a once in a generation pandemic while facing growing economic, political, societal stressors, all, the, all at the while that technology continues to increase and force us to adapt to change. These conditions have caused stress on both our individual and collective mental health, straining a mental health system that was already under-resourced prior to the pandemic. The computer revolution we all experienced at the end of the 20th century transformed our society from an industrial to a technology-based society and economy, and it unlocked new mental health innovations and uh, systems of care deliberately. 
Why these new approaches often hold tremendous promise, we need to understand their potential strengths, limitations, as well as how best to deploy and fit them for our patients and communities. I'm proud to have graduated from the residency here in 2001, and I then underwent a fellowship at the Centers for American Indian Alaska Native Health and have spent my career here at the university in the Department of Veterans Affairs. My work has been with underserved populations, including native, military, and rural communities. And I was drawn to innovations and technologies around the promise that they have of addressing the severe access to quality mental health care that many of the communities I work with have faced. Today, we are bringing together the innovations in the department and also integrating the foundational work of the National Mental Health Innovation Center into a burgeoning collection of projects and activities and innovations. We'll seek to amplify these through partnerships and collaborations within our department, the Anschutz and other CU campuses and connecting with the wider Colorado community, bringing together academia, industry, community and government to work on these problems. Our efforts will have three areas of focus, technology, including mobile apps, telehealth, informatics, artificial intelligence, therapeutics, such as new drug development and implantable technologies, and care redesign, which seeks to take these innovations and integrate them into our existing healthcare delivery systems. So tonight, we're going to learn about several different innovations ranging from technology to new therapeutics to try and understand their use and benefits and potential for widespread dissemination. You can see in the slide above me, I won't read uh, people's uh, uh, titles, but just briefly describe what we'll be going over. Uh, Dr. Neil Epperson will start off, off speaking to technology in the form of digital therapeutics. As chair of the department, her vision is our, our department will improve the mental health landscape of Colorado by harnessing evidence-based technologies and therapeutics targeting mental illness and substance use disorder. Following her, Dr. Andrew Novick will discuss novel drug development and testing. He serves as a clinical investigator for the department's initiatives to develop novel drug therapeutics with a current focus on the use of psilocybin for depression. Um, then we'll have a series of speakers talking about implantable technologies in the form of deep brain stimulation, starting with Dr. Rachel Davis, who will discuss the use of deep brain stimulation for severe refractory obsessive compulsive disorder, where she leads our department in these efforts. Dr. Moksha Patel will describe his experience as a patient receiving deep brain stimulation for obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, this series will conclude with Dr. Sakai discussing deep brain stimulation for methamphetamine use disorder. He'll talk about his team efforts in this area. Of note, uh, Dr. Sakai and myself are both graduates of Tulane Medical School. I met him on the first day of anatomy class because it goes Sakai and Shore. He's become a good friend, but arguably, including as he was trying to rehearse tonight, I've been distracting and interrupting his work, but I promise I will not do that until the question part of the session. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Epperson. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, I really appreciate um, your stepping up to become vice chair for innovation in the Department of Psychiatry. And you've been a great leader in the department for a long period of time. And so your knowledge and your reputation nationally is really going to benefit our work here. I also have to give a major shout out to one of our biggest cheerleaders, and that is Chancellor Don Elliman. I have to say, without the chancellor and his support, we would not be as successful as I hope you can see that uh, we are as a department, um, and especially in our innovations efforts. Um, again, he has two of these a year, and we have so many wonderful programs here on the CU Anschutz Medical Campus. And the fact that you chose psychiatry and innovations to highlight tonight is truly, truly just humbling, and I am so grateful. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so as Jay said, I'm going to do digital um, technology. Um, I really do believe that it is a shining hope with respect to providing preventions as well as treatments for people with uh, suffering from the brain disorders that we refer to as psychiatric disorders or substance use disorders. 
But I have an actual confession to make. Um, I stand up here in front of you, a convert on digital therapeutics, but it was a hard, I'm a hard one convert, possibly because there were so many digital products that were coming out um, in the course of the uh, past decade. Many of them have not been fully vetted in a clinical setting. They are direct to consumer products. They have no evidence of efficacy or safety. And providers in the community really have a difficult time knowing which ones of these are to be used, which ones are safe for their patients. Plus the fact, you know, I'm relational. Psychiatry, psychology, therapy is a relational uh, activity. But we know regardless of the field of medicine that the provider-patient relationship is critical to patient outcomes and provider morale. So taking the provider out of this equation was something that was a little bit hard for me to digest. Telehealth was simple because you have a provider, they're just not in the room with you, but you have a provider that is with you at the same time when you're talking about the issues. And they can provide real-time interventions. And you can also provide real-time feedback about how things are going in your life. There's no waiting for somebody to text you back. Um, there's no using a digital product that doesn't speak to you or talk to you or have a provider in the background. So that was easy. This was the hard sell taking the provider out of the doctor or provider-patient relationship and having this direct-to-consumer um, you know, uh, products that people had to vet on their own. So I was hesitant about this. I, I mean, I am committed to evidence-based care. I am committed to patient safety. So I didn't see that a lot of products out there were really paying attention to that. So I was hesitant. I'm a convert now, and I hope you'll see why, because we have built some relationships with um, one company that I'm going to talk to you about in depth, but we've had, this is just one of many relationships that we have built, built that have made me confident that this is going to be um, what we should be doing in order to provide access to people in the community. And the department and psychiatry as a field is not the first to be a, a little frightened by technology um, and to be worried about embracing it. Um, this gentleman designed the uh, CT scanner in the 1970s, and for the first time, you could really see a beautiful image of the brain, and you could see where the lesion is, whether that's a stroke or an infarct or a tumor. And leaders in neurology were actually interacting and writing to each other about, oh my gosh, is this going to obviate the need for the neurologist? Are we going to be able to stay in practice? And I can tell you that those leaders embraced technology. And if you've tried to get in to see a neurologist recently, surely no one is going out of business. So we in psychiatry have to embrace these technologies as well, because if we don't, we'll be left at the station. The other important aspect of it is that if we don't embrace them and we don't insert ourselves in the discussion, then we have problems with uh, people providing technologies that haven't been vetted. We don't know if they're evidence-based and whether they're safe. There's another reason I'm a convert when it comes to digital technology is that, as Chancellor Elliman said, we can't clinic our way out of this, at least not in the traditional sense. We have a access problem. I know you all know this, and this slide is a little depressing, but this is our country, and this slide was put together um, where these data were collected by the University of Michigan uh, School of Public Health. And what you can see here is that across the nation, these boxes and these colors basically represent the amount of, or the number of psychiatrists per 100,000 residents in that community. So the numbers gray means zero psychiatrists per 100,000 population to green, which is almost nine psychiatrists per 100,000. So I'm hoping you're looking at this and what really strikes you, how much gray we have. Those are people living in psychiatry deserts. And let's just talk about psychologists as well. There's 33% of our counties across the United States only have a, a single practicing psychologist. And some of our treatments are actually better managed by psychologists and therapists like licensed clinical social workers who have been trained um, in particular areas. Now, the other thing I hope you're asking yourself, well, I see some green up there. 
is that enough? Are those places where there are enough psychiatrists? Is, is nine psychiatrists sufficient? And the answer is no. The answer is that basically we're supposed to have 14. 14 psychiatrists per 100,000 uh, individuals living in a certain region. And you can see where I've drawn circles around um, a few places. That is where we have at least 14 psychiatrists per 100,000. Nowhere in the state of Colorado do we have 14 psychiatrists per 100,000. So until we can color our state green, and as the chair of the Department of Psychiatry, the only academic Department of Psychiatry in this state, it is critical that we color ourselves green, and that is something that we have to be doing. Um, and again, training psychiatrists, but it's gonna take years. And so we have to think about other technologies. We really have to think outside the box. All right, I wanna say a little bit about the Department of Psychiatry um, and just help you understand who we are. We're about 700 um, employees, about 400 faculty, spread between Pueblo and Fort Logan, including uh, us here and in Colorado Springs. And we have touched over 200,000 lives in the past year. That is through direct patient treatment, uh, groups, uh, consultations to pediatricians, consultations to primary care docs, helping them to better care for their patients. But we can't really do at all. We can't cover the whole state. And so innovation is I'm always, I'm one of those people that I choose every new job based upon the impact that we can have in our, for people, particularly those suffering with mental illness and substance use problems. Um, so innovations is key. Um, we can expand our reach with our colleagues in CU Innovations. Um, Kim Muller and her team have done an amazing job of helping to vet different companies that we could potentially build a relationship with, and then supporting us as we work with those companies. Uh, we also have to give a shout out to our two hospitals that are on this campus, Children's Hospital Colorado and UC Health. Uh, UC Health has invested deeply in the product that I'm going to be telling you about, and we are testing that product within the UC Health footprint. And we could not do this work without our hospital partners as well. And with Chancellor Elliman, um, he has devoted for the next five years a million dollars a year to our efforts to expand uh, our work in technology as well as uh, medication development and care redesign as uh, Dr. Shore mentioned. So those are going to be our three pillars. He created the National Mental Health Innovation Center with donors and it has made a world of difference when it comes to our ability to move forward with technology. But we think as a Department of Psychiatry, we need to expand our focus, not just from technology and digital therapeutics, but also to include advances in new medications. Because quite frankly, many of our medications are, are inadequate. And so we're really grateful for this support to be able to do that. And then to redesign the care that we provide so that we can incorporate these digital technologies and new treatments to impact more people across the state of Colorado. So I wanna highlight this amazing relationship we have with a company called Health Rhythms. Now, it is a digital health product. And why did I decide that I wanted to go deep and really commit myself and the effort for the Department of Psychiatry and and go to the folks at UC Healthcare's Innovation Center and get the hospital really invested in this company. The reason being is that we see patients maybe once every month, sometimes three months, and then they go out of our office and life happens. I mean, that's just the way it is. Everything can be fine on the day that you're having your appointment. A week later, something happens or your sleep gets disrupted or you, know, you have an extra stressor. And it's hard to know whether you are in a situation that you need additional help because you're not seeing a provider right away. So we joined with Health Rhythms, and I'll tell you a little bit about the product in just a minute. But again, I want to highlight UC Healthcare's innovations over at UC Health because they have been really, really critical partners. And it was an example of meeting their needs as well as our needs uh, to promote mental health care. Uh, throughout the system. So what is Health Rhythms? It's a passive uh, digital 
uh, is this? Yeah, it is coming up. Um, this is a passive digital uh, product that you put and you load on your cell phone that basically measures what we call behavioral vital signs. And again, that may sound like, what do you mean behavioral vital signs? Well, in psychiatry, we don't have very many functional measures. It's not like we can measure blood pressure or blood glucose and say, okay, this person's fine. Um, they're doing well with their medication. We're solving the problem. We have self-report. So it's very subjective. And try to remember the last time you were able to report on how you felt last week, right? How did you feel yesterday? Anybody remember how, were they in a good mood yesterday? Did they feel like they were accomplished? I mean, was yesterday a good day? I mean, like, ah, you know, it's very hard to know. So if you have this on your phone and it passively collects information about your sleep, whether you're on your phone in the middle of the night, whether you are going out of your house. It doesn't tell you where you're going, but it does tell how, how much you leave your home. You're getting sunshine. You're also actively involved in working uh, with other people. Those are behavioral, those are things that we know, exercise, all of that. Those are things that we know are really good for people's mental health. And one of the reasons why I decided that this was an important company was not only because it would provide information through passive monitoring on people's phones between visits, it, would also, it was also evidence-based. It had already been tested with the patient population where basically what the remarkable thing is is that this product could predict a mental health relapse, a recurrence of depression or a crisis a week prior, a week, a whole seven days prior to the patient recognizing that they were in trouble. And the provider could be alerted. And they did it with 90% accuracy. So isn't that remarkable? And the co-founders are amazing um, psychiatrists and psychologists who have an international reputation. So they're not going to put out a bad product. Um, and so what we're doing is we've downloaded it into My Health Connection. We've already studied 100 patients. This was passively being monitored. Um, and we have the data analytics um, for those 100 patients. Um, this is what the patient-facing uh, or the provider-facing platform looks like. So it's very user-friendly. You can actually track a person's self-report of their mood on top of the, their sleep on a daily basis. And again, you can see with between visits, how is somebody doing? And then the patient themselves also can see how they're doing because they have it on their cell phone. It looks very much like a My Health Connections app, but is actually running this digital, therapy, uh, this digital product. And you can see in this slide uh, the number of alerts. So we have the Virtual Behavioral Health Center at UCH that monitors alerts. So we've had two emergent alerts in the course of uh, a six-week trial with 100 patients, and we had 19 alerts that we consider urgent. And again, what this did is it allowed us to reach out to patients in real time and say, hey, how are you doing? Is, is everything okay? And if it wasn't, getting them back into treatment more quickly. And the patients loved this because they felt more connected to their provider. And they also felt that, you know, if they were slipping, that they would see it. They could actually see how they, were, they would be doing. And so we're now moving in to 2,000 people where we have the current patient um, platform where the patient can see their symptoms as well as the provider. So in summary, to improve brain health, we absolutely need our industry partners. We have to think outside the box. We need our psychiatry and psychology and bioinformatics subject matter experts to say, is this a good product? Is this something that we should be thinking and testing in our population? We need our hospital partners because they have resources that, are, that they can bring to bear, plus a lot of our patients are being treated in these settings. And then we also need our CU innovations and UC healthcare innovations. We need people who understand how to do the academic industry partnership. And the most important thing is that we have that all here at the University of Colorado and Schutz Medical Campus. So thank you. Hello, my name is Andy Novick, and I'm gonna be talking about novel drug development. Um, I wanna start by showing a slide of me. This is me at age 16. 
I am receiving a certificate from the Dean of the School of Pharmacy at the University of Kansas. Uh, School of, um, and um, this was after I completed the program in pharmacy science and drug development. Uh, so this is something I've been interested in in a long time. Why does a 16-year-old go to summer pharmacy camp? <laughs> I couldn't really tell you. I'm sure there's lots of reasons why I was motivated at the time. But what I can tell you is that I think sometimes there are interests. In my case, it was pharmacology and neuroscience that really grab us and don't let go. And this is, and so for me, I ended up going on from pharmacy summer camp, uh, to get my medical degree as well as my PhD. And while I was in grad school, I got to do a lot of cool work. Um, I was using various experimental drugs, manipulating brain chemistry, and I graduated with the sense that the future was bright in terms of psychiatry therapeutics, as well as really bright in terms of my role going forward. That was until I was about to enter my residency in psychiatry and I ended up going to this conference and a very well-known neuroscientist made a comment that would take the wind out of my sails. He said, hypothesis-driven research has yet to make a truly meaningful clinical impact in psychiatry. Now, he was referring to neuroscience research, and essentially what he was saying was that despite all the neuroscience and brain research that we've done to date, we have yet to be able to harness it and improve our treatments. Um, and I started thinking, no, this, this is not possible. What about all the drugs that we have? Or wasn't that neuroscience-driven hypothesis research? Hypothesis-driven research? And so I thought back to some of the work that had really inspired me was the original drug development of antidepressants in the 1950s. And this was a really exciting time in which these new drugs were coming out. We were figuring out how they worked in the brain. Uh, and we were using that to, to, to come up with ideas of what depression was. Uh, this was hypothesis-driven research, of course, right? Um, and then I thought about it some more. And the truth is, is that if you take the example of ipronizid, which was one of our first antidepressants, this was originally an antibiotic for tuberculosis. Um, and it was given to patients in tuberculosis, and their mood and behavior changed to a much greater extent than what was expected. And so here's a famous picture from the annals of psychiatry history. Uh, this, was, uh, this was of a hospital of individuals with tuberculosis who were given the drug ipronizid, and ipronizid became known as the drug that made da patients dance in the hallways. And so what this is all about is that our initial antidepressants were not discovered and researched through hypothesis-driven research. We didn't have ideas about neuroscience in which we then came up with an idea and tried to test things. This was serendipity. And, and actually, most of our original drugs were discovered through serendipity. Um, since then, since 1957, when our first antidepressants came out, we've had about over 30 drugs uh, that have been approved for major depressive disorder. The truth is, is that they're basically copies of, this, of those original two drugs. They work by very similar mechanisms of action. Uh, we've tinkered them here and there, uh, but they don't really have much greater efficacy than the original drugs. And I wanna be really clear that these drugs, when they work, they're impressive. Um, they change and save lives and every, psychiatrist has a story, multiple stories, of the impact that they've had. The problem is, is that when your only options really work by the same biological mechanism of action, there are diminishing returns when people don't respond. 
And so if I have 10 patients who have depression and I give them one of our antidepressants, the data suggests that if we are really lucky, about five of them will have a clinical meaningful response. The five out of 10 that are still suffering, well, I can switch their drug and probably about one more will get better. Then so I still, have, I still have four more that I really need a lot of help. And so if I continue to switch their drugs, if I combine drugs, if I throw everything at them in our toolbox, I'll probably get one more. And so, and this is all assuming that they can tolerate it and that they don't drop out of treatment. And so we have a real big hole uh, in our ability to get people better. And so the question is, how do we transform a stagnant drug pipeline? Well, the first thing is, we have to get out of the 1950s. We have to stop trying to copy these drugs. And instead, we need to start harnessing and taking advantage of all the amazing neuroscience work, both in humans and animals, that has been done since that time. And this work has given us a pretty good idea of the neurobiology of depression. And so I'm going to give you a bit of a simplified view of that. There are neural connections in our brain. Neurons make connections with one another. And they communicate things, and they carry messages. And so some of the things that, they can, that, they, that, they, that they're able to facilitate is our sense of safety, our ability to have a positive self-regard for ourselves, which is the foundation of self-esteem, our ability to think that the world outside of us is an okay place that's worth engaging in, and also our motivation to actually engage in that world. In depression, what happens is that those neural connections responsible for all those things, they literally shrink. And so, the, and so that capacity for those things like motivation and sense of safety, that decreases. That means that the foundation of any of our treatments needs to be restoring the strength and growth of those neural connections. Now, one treatment that's received a lot of attention recently of how uh, we can treat depression are psychedelics. Uh, in particular, a drug psilocybin, which is the active component of magic mushrooms. And we know from animal studies that psilocybin definitely does rapidly enhance neural connections and growth in brain regions relevant to depression. And we have a bunch of ideas about what's the process for this in humans. Um, and the current dogma is that psilocybin binds to a receptor in our brain. It's called the serotonin type 2A receptor. But the important thing is that this receptor is responsible for the subjective psychedelic experience. So you take psilocybin, binds to this receptor, you have about an eight-hour trip. Um, this trip is a really powerful experience. Some people describe it as life-changing. And, and the current dogma states that, yeah, this trip, during this trip, you come up with new ideas, new ways of seeing the, seeing the world, and that's what leads to this enhancement in neural growth and connection. Well, there's been some, there's been some research recently that's put that dogma into question. And some work in animals has found that you can actually block that serotonin type 2A receptor, that receptor that's responsible for its subjective psychedelic effects in humans, such that you wouldn't get that psychedelic effect. And we still see the same neural growth. Now, the brilliant antidepressant pharmacologist who did that animal work, Dr. Scott Thompson, we actually recruited him here and he's here at our university to help lead our novel drug initiative. Now, of course, Dr. Thompson's work is in animals. And so 
our next step is that we have to start taking some of his work and the work of others and testing in, his hum in humans. And this is where I come in. So as part of our novel drug development initiative, we're going to be doing a bunch of things. And we have studies planned, which, like I was just saying, trying to figure out what exactly is the role of the 2A receptor? Do we need this psychedelic experience in order to, in order to harness the, the antidepressive potential of psilocybin? We're also going to be using advanced brain imaging to make sure that a drug like psilocybin is actually correcting the dysfunction in the brain that's present in depression, especially in those individuals, that 30% who don't respond at all to our current treatments. That's really important. We also need to determine, once again, we're going to be using advanced brain imaging techniques who are the people who are likely to respond to psilocybin? This is essential if we want to move towards individualized medicine, which is something that I think you would all agree our patients really deserve. Something that we also need to figure out that, we're, that we have a study planned is what can we combine with psilocybin? We need to make sure that traditional antidepressants, other drugs, don't impair and any drug that we do combine with psilocybin will only enhance its antidepressant potential. And finally, we're collaborating with, with companies that have, that, have, that have identified other novel antidepressant compounds beyond psilocybin. And we are going to be testing, them, testing it in humans to make sure that it's engaging the targets in the brain that would predict its antidepressant potential. So what I just described this is neuroscience-informed, hypothesis-driven antidepressant research. Now, if Dr. Epperson would have come up to that 16-year-old and said, you know, a couple of decades, this is the type of work that you're going to be doing, he would have had a much bigger smile. You would have seen much more of his braces. Um, <laughs> Uh, but doing this type of research actually is really important so that we continue to inspire young scientists. It's also really important that we do this research because there, there are individuals, there are animal researchers who have devoted their lives to this with the goal that it would eventually be translated into humans. It's also really important that we do this type of research for the field of psychiatry to prove that we do have novel treatments in the pipeline that won't, and, that we're, and, it, and, and it won't just be dependent on serendipity. But most importantly, we owe this research to our patients because they deserve not just novel treatments, not just new and novel treatments, but novel treatments that we actually understand and have the greatest odds of being effective. Thank you. All right, so I get to talk with you about my absolute favorite topic, which is deep brain stimulation, or DBS, for obsessive compulsive disorder. And then you get to hear from my colleague and uh, patient, Dr. Moksha Patel, his uh, firsthand experience with DBS for OCD. So DBS requires a neurosurgical procedure to implant electrodes in the deeper structures of the brain. And because of this, because it's brain surgery, we reserve for people who have really tried and not responded to all standard treatment. So I'm going to show you a brief uh, video clip to, to introduce you to DBS. Um, it's of one of my patients and me in the operating room. Now, I am not doing the surgery. I am a psychiatrist. So I want to acknowledge my neurosurgery colleagues, uh, Dr. Steve Ogeman, who is here tonight, who is uh, co-director of our OCD surgical program, and also my mentor, Dr. Aviva Abosh, who uh, started this program with me at uh, CU Anschutz, and this is uh, Moksha's brain. What are you feeling? Uh, a bit of joy. Um, I think my mood went up more. Interesting. When was the last time you felt like this, job? Thinking back. I honestly don't know. It probably was younger than five. All right, so 
So I want to give a shout out to my patient, John, who's back here. John, you want to raise your hand? He gave me permission to acknowledge him. And uh, he said he'd be happy to talk with people or answer questions afterwards. So you might be surprised that he was awake during surgery. And uh, we, the surgery can be done awake because the brain doesn't actually sense physical pain. And there are some advantages to doing the surgery awake. We can turn on stimulation during surgery to... Uh, test whether we're in the right uh, location, whether we get the response that we're looking for, which is improved mood, reduction in anxiety, and improved energy. Now, the surgery can also be done asleep with similar efficacy under MRI or CT guidance, and that's actually how Dr. Patel had his surgery. So I think in order for you to appreciate the magnitude of the impact that DBS can have for someone with severe and refractory OCD, I think it's important that you understand what OCD is. So OCD is not an adjective. Uh, Shout out to my colleague, Emily Hemendinger, who's our DBS coordinator who keeps things uh, organized, and also Pamela David Gerecht in uh, neurosurgery, who also is our coordinator. So unfortunately, in society today, the term OCD is often trivialized. People throw out the term, I'm so OCD, to refer to being clean or organized or liking things a particular way, almost as if having OCD is kind of cute. But true OCD is a debilitating illness. It leads to significant suffering in those who are afflicted. It affects 1% to 2% of the world's population, or 2 to 3% of the U.S. population. And for most, it's a chronic disorder, with only about 60% of people responding to standard treatment, and only about 10% of people going into remission with ongoing treatment. And then there's another 10% who remain severely affected, and these are the people who are candidates for potential neurosurgical interventions. People with OCD experience obsessions, and obsessions are intrusive thoughts, unwanted thoughts, that are usually the most gory, violent, humiliating, embarrassing thoughts that people could ever imagine. And people are embarrassed. They're ashamed. And so people hide their symptoms. And this contributes to long delays to diagnosis, with most people, on average, going anywhere from 11 to 17 years between the onset of symptoms and the time to receiving an accurate diagnosis. Now, in response to their obsessions, people do compulsions or rituals in attempt to alleviate their anxiety or prevent something bad from happening. But the problem is the, the rituals are either unrealistically connected or they're excessive. And though they may provide temporary relief of anxiety, it ultimately perpetuates a vicious cycle and leads to worsening and worsening anxiety. And probably one of the most painful aspects of OCD is that it tends to involve the things and values and people that are most important to the people with OCD. So for example, someone may love their dog very much, and they may value respect and compassion towards animals, but they have an intrusive fear that they're going to accidentally harm their animal, when in reality they are probably the least likely person to do that, but it doesn't feel that way. So this is a nice picture, right? It's beautiful, it's calm, it's peaceful. Well, I showed this to one of my patients with OCD, and she honed in on that kind of orange area in the clouds in the middle there, and she said, you know what? It looks like there's probably a fire there. And this is a perfect metaphor for what it's like to have OCD. A brain with OCD is primed to detect potential for danger. And notice I say potential, not actual danger, but potential for danger. It's all about the what ifs. What if something bad happens? What if I did something bad? What if I'm going to do something bad? And now I'm going to switch to first person for a minute. It it occurred to me that it would be hypocritical for me to support my uh, patient, Dr. Patel, who is also a physician, in being vulnerable in sharing his story with OCD while I hide behind the guise of being just an expert. So I also have OCD. I've had OCD since I was a young child. So those of us with OCD get to live with a brain that is constantly telling us the world looks like this. Now, we logically know, we understand that the world really looks like this, but there's a disconnect, and that logic doesn't translate into relief. Now, I understand the world never actually looks this peaceful, right? But I think you probably get my metaphor. Um, And I'll tell you, even as someone who has responded reasonably well to standard treatment, my brain, more often than not, is telling me that the world looks like this. And it's exhausting. But it is also the reason that I am able to have compassion for others who are suffering and that I have a strong desire to alleviate their pain. It's why I love my work and the people that I have the privilege of working with. 
So let's talk about what is deep brain stimulation. So deep brain stimulation is most commonly used in Parkinson's disease, a movement disorder. OCD is the only psychiatric indication with FDA approval, although it has been studied in multiple other psychiatric disorders, including depression. And CU and UC Health uh, are just one of a few centers in the world that offers this treatment for refractory OCD. Um, as I said, it's done rarely, and it's reserved for people with the most refractory illness. And so we've uh, done surgery on about one patient per year, so eight patients since 2015. And there have been less than 400 surgeries worldwide um, of DBS for OCD. So it involves, like I said, implantation of electrodes in the deeper structures of the brain. Those electrodes are connected to, pulse or connected to extension wires, which are tunneled down beneath the skin, down the neck, and connected to pulse generators in the chest, which look very much like uh, cardiac pacemakers, except they uh, deliver a low dose of electrical current to the brain. And then we can change the electrical stimulation by communicating with this programmer, which sits over the patient's pulse generator via Bluetooth on this tablet. And I'll uh, talk with you a little bit more later about what the programming process is like. And uh, how does it work? We don't know exactly. Um, but we, we do know that we modify uh, brain circuits and we are normalizing some of the abnormal um, activity that we see in OCD. So this is just a picture of the area that we target. Uh, it's called the ventral capsule ventral striatum. And um, the VCVS is um, either involved in or connected to other brain areas that are involved in reward processing, fear, uh, anxiety, and determining whether someone uses goal-directed value-based decision-making versus reflexive or habitual behavior, which uh, we tend to see uh, an overuse of in OCD. So I'm going to show you a bit more of that video that we started with. The actual brain surgery part, that was my least fear. What were you afraid of? Mainly it just not working. That would be like, you know, probably the most disappointing thing, so. Once the electrodes are in place, we do interoperative stimulations. We actually had a team from Alabama observing the surgery, and that was a trigger for him because anything from the South is considered contaminated. We had him interact with uh, the team members and assessed how anxious this made him. When stimulation was turned on, he was actually a little bit better able to interact. What do you think about us, you know, playing going to a view later today? <laughs> <laughs> we also had a fast food wrapper, and we assessed his ability to touch it. Willing to consider a little bit, maybe? Um. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Okay. We had his phone in there, because his phone is his prized possessions, which he tries to keep clean and not contaminated. And so we assessed his ability to let us contaminate it with the wrapper, or let the person from Alabama hold it. We turn on stimulation and we test to be sure that we're getting the response that we want. Change in mood, like a lessening of depression and a reduction in anxiety. Does it feel like you could move on and think about other things now or you feel pretty stuck on the exposures we just did? It does feel easier to move on. If we get that, that bodes well down the road for uh, a reduction in OCD symptoms. All right, so I want to call out something. Do you notice how calm John is in that surgery? He didn't have anesthesia. We didn't give him anything for anxiety. And I think uh, something that uh, many of our patients with OCD will say is that having brain surgery awake is nothing compared to living with the daily torment that they deal with. All right, so I'm going to talk with you a little bit about uh, programming. So I get really excited talking about the physics of the electrical stimulation in DBS, but I have learned that not everybody shares my same level of enthusiasm. So I'm going to rein it in, and what I want you to take from this slide basically is that there are lots of things that we can change in order to vary the shape of the current, the strength of the current, how we deliver the current, uh, which specific precise areas of the brain that we're targeting. And during initial programming, which occurs over three days, um, we go through hundreds of combinations of different settings to try to find the 
uh, settings with the best response and the least side effects. And so I'm going to show you uh, another brief video clip. This is of Dr. Patel. And uh, the first part of the clip is him explaining what his mood has been like since surgery, but before stimulation was turned on. And then you'll see a little bit of actually during our initial programming. Since the surgery, mood has been down. Um, not really sure why. Uh, for the first two weeks, it was definitely just pretty depressed and gloomy. Um, and then I had a presentation at work, which went really well. And despite that, just kind of emotional lability, feeling close to tears all the time. Um, but uh, I think mood maybe picked up a little bit once I started getting involved in work. Let's go up to like a five. Okay, and which face? Let's give it a four. Okay. Um, and uh, can people see he's got a left half smile? Yes. Yeah. So you're, can you feel yeah, you're yeah. smiling on your left side? I thought I was smiling everywhere, but apparently not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so you have a half smile, um, which is what we're looking for, so. Well, that was good talk on that, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I told my mom about the half smile. Yeah. I think a good shot, but yeah. And so, um, as we're sitting here on the setting for a little bit, anything else? coming to mind or thoughts? No, but my mood feels a lot better than it has in... Oh, can you switch it up completely? <laughs> <laughs> Take it right. home? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, my mood does feel better. Okay. All right, and you'll get to hear more from Dr. Patel here in just a bit. So I'm going to tell you briefly about three areas of research and uh, kind of the future directions of DBS for OCD. So uh, I want to acknowledge my colleagues here, uh, Dr. Jody Tanabi, who's a neuroradiologist, Dr. John Thompson, who's a, a neurophysiologist and electrophysiologist, Keith Dodd, who's an MD-PhD student, and Elizabeth Finstermacher, who does programming uh, as well uh, alongside Dr. Sakai and myself. So what you see here is uh, this is actually a, an image, a slice of uh, Moksha's brain. And uh, Dr. Tanabe has used a technique called diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI, to pull out a couple of potentially relevant white matter tracks or nerve tracks in the brain. And then John and uh, Keith have uh, recreated the trajectory of the electrodes and uh, simulated, put in the programming parameters to simulate the electrical field. And we're looking to see which uh, nerve fiber tracks that we're capturing. Uh, because what we're learning is it's probably not just the anatomical location that we target that is, uh, that is necessary it is, or important. It is also the fiber tracks that we're capturing, which can be different in um, each individual patient. And then we're comparing these um, fiber tracks that are captured to uh, patients' uh, clinical improvement and rating scale scores with the hope that um, we can identify preemptively which fiber tracks we should be targeting uh, before going into surgery and uh, target those. Uh, the next area of research involves the newer type of electrodes that not only can um, deliver electricity, but sense the electrical activity of the brain around the area of the electrodes. And these are called local field potentials. And so we had the ability to give the patient, in this case, Moksha, uh, the ability to press a button when he experiences a specific obsession or a trigger. So what you see here are three different triggers. and uh, You'll see we have this peak here. It's in what's called the theta band frequency. And you see that we get that with each different trigger. But when he's calm and actually listening to ocean music, um, that peak isn't there. And so this is what we hope is a, a biomarker, which is basically a physiologic indicator of an emotional or behavioral state that we can then better use to more precisely uh, program and as well as monitor for resolution of the disease state. Oh, and I uh, can't forget to thank Dr. Dan Rabel, who has helped us uh, with this uh, research and also created these graphs. All right, and the third area of research is extending the use of DBS into schizophrenia. So there have been a few um, patients worldwide who've had DBS for schizophrenia with uh, positive results. 
But as you can imagine, uh, there are some ethical concerns about using brain surgery in this vulnerable population, some of it which stems from a questionable ethical history of what was then called psychosurgery in the mid to late 1900s. So we are taking a look at some of these concerns, and one of the areas we're looking at is um, whether or not people with schizophrenia have the ability to fully um, appreciate and understand the risks and potential benefits, as well as uh, provide informed consent for the surgery. And then we're also looking at surgical risk using a couple of different methods. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-PIs, Dr. Judy Gott and also Dr. Ellen Sachs, as well as Dr. Paul um, Applebaum. And then these are, uh, this is just a graph of uh, data from our eight patients here at CU Anschutz. And so uh, this is the Wild Brown, uh, Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale, which is the standard scale that we use to measure OCD symptoms. And uh, what you see is their baseline scores. So almost everybody started in the severe to extreme range. And then we have the six month, and then we have last follow up, which in this cohort is anywhere from one year to seven years. And uh, a good response to DBS is a 35% reduction in symptoms. So DBS is not a cure, and that may not sound like that much, but it actually is quite significant. So uh, a 35% reduction in symptoms could mean someone goes from spending 12 hours per day um, doing compulsions, not able to leave the house, to maybe spending six hours per day and able to go to school with significant support. So it can really have an impact on quality of life. Now, in the literature, about 50 to 70% of people have a good response to DBS. And as you can see, we had about six out of eight people who had a, what's considered a full response or a 75% response rate. So we're basically right in line with the literature. And so I'd like to end on this uh, slide here uh, that emphasizes that DBS is not a cure. It can have remarkable um, effects for some patients, but people do best if they continue on with other treatments as well. So most people have to continue medication. And um, it's important that people continue in a type of therapy called exposure and response prevention therapy, or ERP. And in this type of therapy, people are exposed to their fears or triggers in a graduated manner and um, supported in not doing rituals or not engaging in the usual activities that they do to reduce their anxiety. So this is a screenshot of Moksha and me just a few weeks ago, actually, during one of our virtual ERP sessions. And I am encouraging him. He's sitting on his bathroom floor. I'm encouraging him to scoot closer and closer to his toilet. And eventually, he used the toilet as a coffee table for his boba. Um, this would have been unimaginable uh, prior to DBS, um, completely unimaginable. Wouldn't have been able to even get him in his bathroom. So. I like to say we were having a lot of fun during this session. I'm not sure Moksha was having a lot of fun, but I was very excited at how well he was doing and how much he was able to push himself. And with that, I am going to turn this over to Dr. Patel to tell his part of the story. So just to clarify, that was not fun <laughs> for me, um, but I know it was important. Um, so good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you all for being here and for allowing me to share my story. The story I'm going to tell in the next few minutes is a story of challenging a debilitating mental illness. It's a story of acceptance, hope, and courage. But at its core, it's a story of how CU transformed my life, a real-life metamorphosis. Now, as Dr. Shore mentioned, I am faculty here in the Division of Hospital Medicine. However, I'm not here to speak to you in that role. Rather, I'm here to speak as someone who suffered from debilitating OCD since four or five years of age. As Dr. Davis mentioned, OCD is a disorder in which patients get repetitive, intrusive, and unwanted thoughts or obsessions. These thoughts can be about anything. They cause immense distress, and that distress triggers patients like myself to perform rituals, often unrealistic ones. For me, OCD was ubiquitous. It affected all parts of my life. However, the most obvious of my symptoms were around contamination. That there's a picture of my hand with broken skin from washing it 20 to 50 times a day with harsh soap and chemicals. Due to my fear of contamination, for the greater part of the last two decades, I would only use my restroom, and after using it every single time, would shower 
or cleanse for over an hour. Well, as you can imagine, that caused a lot of physical and emotional distress. So I reduced my food and water intake. I've also used just about every chemical cleaner known to man on my skin, in my mouth, in ways not intended to be used, causing burns, abrasions, and other injuries. But OCD seeps to every part of your life. It affected my ability to go to college, where I went to college, how I participated in extracurriculars. It strained all of my relationships, family, friends, romantic relationships. It's affected my ability to travel. I was first diagnosed in 2007, though I'd had symptoms for many years before that. Since then, I've seen 13 plus professionals in three different cities. I've tried eight to 10 classes of psychiatric medications, all evidence-based. I've even tried therapy, including exposure response prevention therapy, DBT, group therapy, you name it. I even went to a yoga retreat pictured there. Um, that's at Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. Did not cure my OCD, but highly recommend it to anyone who loves the outdoors. Um, it was a great place, great view. And despite all of these efforts, I was drowning to the point where I wrote this. Imagine your mind, the basis of your reality, has been consumed for decades by a thrashing sea storm full of waves of dreadful anxiety followed by the thunderous diminishing... Sorry, guys, I haven't memorized this quote yet. With, <laughs> with waves of unwanted thoughts followed by the thunder and lightning of dreadful anxiety. Beneath that, there lies an unyielding need for certainty in a world full of doubt. Imagine drowning in this existence for years and failing every attempt to ascend. Then, when you have finally given up hope, the miracle of a rare but effective brain surgery changes your reality. The obsessive waves are subdued and the burden of thunderous anxiety diminished. You can finally learn to stop seeing the world in black and white and appreciate the beautiful colors instead. That is the blessing that deep brain stimulation surgery has been for me. And what a blessing it's been. Since receiving my surgery in September of 2021, I feel reborn. I can eat freely, drink freely, use the restroom freely. I feel like I can chase a peace hitherto unobtainable. But why am I sharing this at a session on transforming healthcare? Well, I've got two goals. First is to recognize the people and institutions at CU that are transforming lives on a daily basis. And the second is to discuss ways that all of us together in this room can continue to transform the lives of others. So to that first goal, I'll tell you a full list of all the people I have to thank would take me well over five hours. So I'll spare you all from that. And I'll start with some of the people in this room including Dr. Rachel Davis, a psychiatrist, and her excellent team of psychiatrists, therapists, social workers, etc. Thank you for your expert and compassionate care. Dr. Stephen Ogeman and his neurosurgical team, thank you for your steady hands, your expert care, and for not removing any of the quirky parts of my brain when you were in there. <laughs> and finally, for CU leadership, starting with none other than Chancellor Don Elliman, Many people don't know this, but Chancellor Elliman took a personal interest in my case, and his support was absolutely instrumental in getting me the surgery I needed. Not only this, but Chancellor Elliman has created a culture of nurturing and support at CU that has trickled down to all my leaders, including my division head, Dr. Marisha Burden, who's in the back, and I appreciate it. For all of you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> And on to that second goal, all of us are here because we have invested large parts of our lives and careers into transforming the lives of others. And today we've heard about amazing drugs, amazing technologies. And I'll tell you, if we truly want to continue to transform healthcare, we need to look no further than our people. I know this. You see, my life was transformed, not just because of this amazing piece of technology, but because of the clinicians, the chancellors, the attorneys, everyone who ensured I got the surgery I needed. My life was transformed because a chief medical resident noticed I wasn't eating or drinking in a 12-hour shift and ensured that I got plugged into care. My life was transformed because a bedside nurse took time out of her busy ICU shift and spoon-fed me jello after 10 hours of anesthesia. If we truly want to transform healthcare, we need to look no further than within, use our passions, our dreams, our fears, and use our humanity to drive better brain health for all. 
Thank you. So during our practice, I asked actually if I could go after Dr. Patel because, oh my God, going after that. Um, but I'd just like to start by having you imagine a seven-year-old girl. And she's in an elementary school parking lot. And there's a crowd of children, and they're playing, and they're laughing. And parents come through, and they pick up their children. And there are fewer and fewer until she's the only one left. And then she gets up, and she says, oh my god, I guess he's really not coming. I'll have to figure out how to find my way home. These are the kinds of stories that I heard throughout my childhood from my mother about her father, my grandfather, who disappeared into a fog of alcoholism throughout her life. He was probably the most important person to her growing up, and she loved him dearly. But I think if she were honest, there was also a piece of her that probably hated him a bit, too. And then I came along. Little Joey, as I was called at the time, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and to my mother, I was the reincarnation of her dad in mannerisms, in personality, in sense of humor. I can remember actually coming out of the bathroom in a bathrobe and my mother gasping and saying, it's just like my dad. And actually, uh, she thought I looked like him a lot, too. And I will let you be the judge. I'm not sure I see the resemblance. Um, some of you might say, well, that the beard makes it a little hard to see. But I don't think that that helps much. <laughs> so my mother embarked on her own substance use prevention program with me at dinner, in the morning, Whenever there was a lull, she would talk about her dad and about his choices and about our family, which is littered with individuals with alcoholism, and about my risk and about the hope that I would make better choices. And so I ended up being kind of a strange kid. Uh, <laughs> in high school, I, uh, I, I didn't go to parties. I didn't drink. I was a bit socially awkward. I'm still socially awkward. <laughs> uh, and I saw along the way people get their lives disrupted. Very brilliant, smart people. And then when I got to medical school, you go through the hospital and you just see how many people were there in part because of substance problems. And I found that I enjoyed sitting with folks and talking with them. And I enjoyed that work. Now, at, at that time, in that era, there were also many providers who were irritated at times with patients with substance use disorder or frustrated with them. And I can see that too. Um, so for example, when I was early in my career, I can remember sitting with a patient with a cocaine use disorder and he was talking to me about how his wife had left and how he really was going to dedicate things for his son, that his son was very important, that his son needed a father like he didn't have and he knew how valuable that was. And then he went out and he used cocaine in this very big binge, and he missed his son's birthday party. And I thought to myself, why am I so gullible, right? I, I thought he was telling me the truth. But actually, we know a lot more about the neuroscience of addiction now. And I'm just going to walk you through very briefly this study that will give some, hopefully, small insight. So in this study, uh, individuals were asked to lay down in an MRI machine and they were shown a picture of a pirate on the left or the right. There was a delay, and then there were two chests, and they had to remember, was the pirate on the left or the right? And then they got a reward. And they did this repeatedly over a series of five runs. It sounds really boring. I think I probably would have fallen asleep in the MRI machine, but, but the participants did this. And um, one of the things that's it's helpful for us to know is that there were three different pictures of pirates, and they were totally linked with either a big reward or a medium-sized reward or a small reward. The participants didn't know that. And actually, when they came out of the MRI machine, almost all of them couldn't tell you that association. But their behavior could tell you that on some level, they knew this. So this is reaction time on the up and down y-axis, and this is time on the x-axis. And what you'll see here is that in the very beginning, uh, the reaction time's the same across the three pictures of the pirates, right? But look what happens by the very end. 
at the end, when folks see the pirate that gives the big reward, they're pressing very quickly. And when they see the pirate that's the low reward, they're taking their time to get there, right? Even though they can't verbalize to you that there is this association. So what happens in the brain? Well, the orange uh, highlight here is the, the nucleus accumbens, which is part of the brain's reward circuit. When it gets stimulated, it feels good, right? So in the gold line to the right, what you can see is what happens in the accumbens across time in the early trials. You see the picture of the pirate. You choose which side they were on, which chest. You get your reward. And when you get your reward, you see the activation. But look what happens in the late trials. Once people sort of have learned this association on some level, there is a prediction that as soon as you see that pirate that gives you the big reward, your accumbens is activating. It is predicting that reward. It is pushing you in that direction, even though you're not conscious of this. Now think about what happens with drugs of abuse. There's a surge in this circuit. It's powerful. Think about the learning that happens in addiction. Think about the person when they smell that puff of, of, of a cigarette, when they see that beer, when they're in that old neighborhood, when they're with an old friend, right? That, that, that the brain is sort of saying, that would be good. Go that direction. And it's effortful to push away from it. Now, I don't mean to say that the neuroscience of addiction is only the brain's reward circuit. It's much more than that. Over the last 30 years, we've learned so much. And actually, you could probably point to any portion of the brain and say, well, it's probably involved, right? Stress response, memory and learning, top-down control, um, negative emotional states. But central to it is this reward circuitry and the nucleus accumbens. Well, I'm here to talk to you about methamphetamine use disorder. And everybody knows about opioid use disorder and the opioid epidemic. But I, you know, I, I fear that at times other substance use disorders get crowded out a bit in the context of that and forgotten. And methamphetamine use disorder affects about one and a half million people in the United States every year. And over a five-year period recently, there was a tripling in the number of people who died from overdoses that implicated methamphetamines. And we have very high relapse rates. And actually, many, many folks do not respond to the treatments that we have. And while we have medications to help with opioids and alcohol and smoking cessation, the number of medications that we have to help patients with a methamphetamine use disorder that are approved by the FDA is zero. And that's not for lack of trying. There have been a large number of clinical trials. So what are we talking about? We're talking about actually utilizing deep brain, deep brain stimulation as an approach to treat treatment refractory methamphetamine use disorder. There are some, some concerns here, of course, you know, this is an invasive procedure. It's a neurosurgical procedure. Psychiatry doesn't have the best history with interventions of this sort. We have to be very careful, very thoughtful, go through ethics reviews and be very, very methodical in what we're doing. Um, and, you know, in, in addition, uh, we, we, we have advantages as well, right? So this is an approach that allows us to touch very deep structures in the brain, to go directly to the circuits that we think are implicated to give continuous stimulation in those regions. Um, and, and really to, to be able to read uh, the, the brain activity from those regions as well uh, to help us to really develop biomarkers like Dr. Davis was talking about for OCD. So what is the evidence supporting that DBS might be useful for methamphetamine use disorder? There is some, <laughs> it's not extensive, uh, but there is some. The, the, the initial reports were incidental findings. So folks were treated for Parkinson's, but suddenly said, hey, I stopped smoking cigarettes. And, and then it was taken into the laboratory and it was done in animal models and showing that you could actually interrupt drug reinstatement. And then there have been case reports or case series in humans. And this is focused mainly on alcohol and opioids and also cocaine. And there's enough evidence that the National Institute on Drug, Drug Abuse a couple of years ago actually funded the first trial uh, to treat opioid use disorder using DBS in West Virginia. So what about methamphetamine use disorder specifically? Well, there are only three cases that I know of worldwide. They're all outside the United States. Um, but those cases are encouraging. Uh, the first individual followed for 30 months 
uh, was able to have sustained abstinence and remission of craving. The second individual, unfortunately, after two months, had a resurgence in craving and relapses. And the third individual, followed for a year, had sustained remission and no reports of craving. Okay, so uh, we had this idea and we went to two local family foundations, the Kane Family Foundation and the Hewitt Family Foundation. We said, we have this idea, we would like to do this. We really wanna push the boundaries of what we can do and really try to develop something that we hope will be more effective. And it's kind of a moonshot, but would you be open and interested in this? And they supported us, which was incredible. And we took that money and we went to NIH, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and we said, we have some funds to start this project, but we would like to do this properly and we'd like to have NIH support. And this summer we received a grant from NIDA, uh, which brings in a little over a million dollars to combine with that foundation funding and to be able to do a study of five individuals uh, to look at safety, feasibility, and whether there is uh, any signal of an outcome. And then if we meet those milestones, essentially NIDA will fund a larger study for three years with a $5.4 million grant to study 20 individuals using this procedure. The first study is what's called a crossover design. Half this uh, sample will essentially start, they'll all have surgery. Ha uh, half the sample will start with sham, which is we don't actually turn on the stimulator. We, 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 we go through all the normal procedures, but don't turn it on. And then after six months, we turn it on. So they have six months off and six months on. And then the other half get the opposite order. And individuals are used as their own control. So what were they like while they were on stimulation in terms of their substance use and craving? And then what were they like when they were not on stimulation? Again, if we have positive results, we will move on to a uh, 10 and 10 randomized controlled trial uh, where essentially we would have sham versus stimulation over a predefined period of time. And then we would start, turn on stimulation for everybody. Now I wanna emphasize that there are many steps along the way to get to a intervention that can be sort of delivered out in the community. Uh, but we are trying to develop uh, the evidence base that would support this. And we've, we've made a lot of steps already, including getting an IDE from the FDA, grant funding, and we're sort of on the perch of beginning this study. I wanna acknowledge our team. We have a number of wonderful people here at CU um, who have made this possible. Uh, Jody Tanabe is here, who is one of the PIs of the grant, as is Aviva Abash, who's in Nebraska as the chair. Uh, we have folks from bioethics, biostatistics, neurosurgery, neurology, neuroscience, and so on. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Davis, who has ta taken the time to teach me DBS programming, making this, this study possible. And of course, the Kane and Hewitt Family Foundations, without whom none of this would be possible. And then I just want to come back to my mom. I, you know, my mom is in her, in her 70s now, and we were talking uh, not too long ago, and she every once in a while will say, what do you do again, exactly? <laughs> and I'll say, oh, well, yeah, let me tell you about that. And we talk about the, uh, the neuroscience of addiction. Uh, and she was pushing back on it and pushing back on it. And she was saying, you know, people are responsible for their choices. People are responsible for their behaviors. I said, well, I agree with you totally. But you know, if the brain is sort of tilted this way and the ball tends to roll that way and it takes effort to sort of not do that, it's a little different, right? And we went back and forth until she finally said, you know, do I have to forgive him? Because I really don't want to. And I think it's different, right? If you have a parent with cancer who didn't show up for school, it's a very different experience than if it's an addiction problem. And the family goes through much and the individual goes through much, so much. And I think we're just hopeful that we can push the boundaries and be more useful, more helpful for folks in the future. So thank you so much. I'd like to invite the uh, panel uh, up and, uh, and could we get another round of applause for a series of amazing presentations. I just feel so grateful to work in an apartment that's doing this work with such compassionate and amazing investigators. Um, and 
Neil is and, and I'll work as a team here, and we're going to open it up for uh, questions from you all, uh, from the audience. So most, uh, based on my recent experience, most artificial intelligence this, this day, especially in um, <clears throat> scientific areas, is a, a um, uh, an advanced version of digital uh, uh, research where, where you do... Uh, uh, you, you you garner a huge number of of a uh, huge amount of data, and then you apply that to digital analysis. Mm -hmm. Is there a repository for everything you guys are all doing, and and who has it? And uh, that's to me uh, to advance the ball further. Uh, this digital analysis of of reams and reams and reams of data mm -hmm. advances the ball faster. So mm -hmm. predictive analytics, yes. I mean, is, is we're given where we are now uh, is, is to me the way to advance the ball faster. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll address that. It's an important question. Um, so the passive remote monitoring plus the patient uh, response to some uh, various questionnaires that we do with the Health Rhythms app, um, they like to call it a health, a health rhythms platform because app sort of sounds um, not quite as robust as what they actually do. They do apply data analytics and predictive modeling. And so AI is used to predict based upon your behavioral vital signs whether you're in trouble. So like if you're a person with bipolar disorder and you can go through periods of not sleeping, do those episodes of sleeping less and less and less can we measure those in real time? And then if the person does have a manic episode, then the provider and the patient can go back. First of all, hopefully the AI algorithm is going to actually alert the provider that the patient needs is getting into trouble. But then you can take those data and go back and look at whether, was, was did it just happen out of the blue? Well, no, most of the time relapses in mental health conditions don't just happen out of the blue. Like I said, life happens. Something might have triggered that person to sleep less. Is that something that's happening a week before they actually become manic um, or two weeks? Is it subtle or is it dramatic? And those kind of data can really be incredibly helpful to us, not only in predicting and then intervening more quick, quickly, but helping us think about the illness itself. Um, I, for example, we want, uh, we've been talking to the Rocky Mountain Multiple Sclerosis Clinic about potentially using health rhythms because it measures things like movement and how fast you move, whether you're in bed, whether you're getting out of your house. And we know that there are serious medical conditions like multiple sclerosis that can have an impact on those particular behavioral vital signs. So is it depression? Or is it multiple sclerosis? Or is it both? Because if you talk to the leaders of our MS center, they will say that about 60 to 70% of people have an anxiety problem or a depression problem, and many of them have sleep disturbance. Uh, pain gets in the way of sleep, uh, those kinds of issues. So we see these data analytics being able to be applied not only for mental health conditions, but in the future also being able to provide the MS pr uh, providers a sense of how their patients are doing at home. Because they tell their patients, we want you to contact us if you have a flare, because that can impact the way they treat patients. But only about 50% of the time do people do that, because I don't think they always know when they're having a flare. So there's multiple medical conditions, not just psychiatric conditions, substance use conditions, helping people uh, keep from relapsing, looking at triggers. So you're right, AI has to be used. One of the things mm -hmm. I would add too, when I, uh -huh. when I started out, you know, the, there, uh, I'm on, okay, yes. Uh -huh. there, there were folks who sort of guarded their data and published on it for decades and didn't share it with anybody. Yes. Um, the standard now is really an open science framework. Mm -hmm. uh, many journals very much encourage it. When you put in a grant to NIH, they talk about how you'll share the resources that are generated from the grant. The hope is um, to be less protective and more inclusive in a way that allows others um, with different skill sets to make use of data that's collected. And so there's really been a revolution uh, in science in recent years to have that stance mm -hmm. for exactly the reason you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Other questions? This is for the doctor that uh, addressed psilocybin. Mm -hmm. um, my 
tangential experience with that were people in my dorm in the middle 60s <laughs> to late 60s who uh, either had great highs or my uh, roommate who tried to burn non-existent spiders off our ceiling and almost you know, set things afire. What is your view of the current uh, ballot initiative to make mushroom drugs legal? Yeah. Sure. Andy, be careful so, with yeah, that one. Yeah. So one thing. We're one, state employees. Yeah. We're not supposed to opine on what's on the ballot. Yeah. So, so yeah, one thing that I very much have accepted, and I and I think was obvious from my talk, was that I have spent my entire life uh, training as a researcher and a physician. Um, and I do not pretend to be an expert on policy <laughs> at all. Um, what I will, what I can comment on is what I want for my patients. Um, and what I really want for my patients is, is a highly researched intervention that we know the proper setting to be in, uh, that we know how this drug should be delivered in a way that's going to be effective for them. And I wanted to have some idea if it's going to be effective for them in the first place. Right. And, so, and so that's what my work does. Um, um, but yeah, I, I think I'm actually going to leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Very well done. I mean, again, uh, Dr. Novick is pointing out that setting is everything and also mindset. Um, you know, there's a lot of support in helping the patient approach this treatment. And again, focusing on patients that have been treatment resistant to our current products um, and helping them to have an, what's the appropriate expectation and what is it that they want to achieve in the session? I don't think they're going to say it's burning uh, imaginary spiders off the roof. Uh, many of these folks have been traumatized. We know that childhood adversity increase the risk of, of mental health concerns. It also makes people more treatment resistant. Um, and so a lot of the people that are gonna be coming into Dr. Novick's study are gonna be people who've suffered trauma, uh, whether as children or later in life, and we know that. And we have to provide a very safe experience. The idea is to help them through this process um, in a way that is expansive but it is safe and they're not distressed through the process because as you know uh, from uh, experimenting in college, you know, anybody that's had friends that have done that, um, it can be a bad trip and that is not helpful for patients with trauma or depression. So our goal is to really create the appropriate safe setting. Yeah, we know that the greatest cause of death in, in children 10 to 20 is currently a suicide. And could you address uh, how your studies are overlapping with uh, pediatric patients, whether it be in OCD or in, in drug abuse, um, and, and let us know what that relationship is and if, if any pediatric patients are being, being included in your studies. Mm -hmm. Well, you want to go with that? I, I can start <laughs> in terms of certainly for our DBS trial, no. Um, the, the, the study will focus on adults. Um, and really, in terms of that, we, we, we want to figure out if it's safe and there is a clear signal of treatment response. In terms of the treatment of adolescents and treatment of substance use disorders, we have a number of folks in the department who are interested in that area, who are trained as child psychiatrists and have also done the addiction psychiatry fellowship, which I'm involved in, um, and who are interested in development of treatment programs or conducting studies um, to better understand what will be most helpful mm -hmm. and implementing evidence-based treatments. But our study um, and where we're pushing the boundaries will only be in adults. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can also speak. I didn't have time to talk about another product. Um, uh, there's a company called We Therapeutics um, that instead of doing remote patient monitoring, it does exactly what I was saying I was really hesitant to get into, which is providing the treatment in the patient's palm of the patient's hand without a provider. Um, and we're doing this work with Yale University, Ohio State, and our colleagues here that are very much suicide prevention experts. And the product, the reason why I really like this product, it is that the, it was created. So even though there's not a human right there, 
it has a human touch all over it, and the touch of those humans are experts. So the experts in providing cognitive behavioral strategies in person created these modules that somebody can use either by themselves or with a provider. So this is a product that can patient can have with them at all times. So if they start to have suicidal ideation, they can quickly go back to the module that shows them what they plan to do, reminds them of how to manage that. And we're, like I said, testing this now with three other institutions in the adult population. We are having conversations with Children's Hospital about moving this product and testing it in the child health space. A lot of the products out there are really being tested in adults. Um, some of the ones that have been offered for children have not been fully vetted. You know, you can imagine that a product for a seven-year-old, and yes, there are seven-year-olds that have suicidal ideation, is very different than a product for an 18-year-old. And so those are the kinds of things that we want to work with, having that industry partnership with our children's division in the Department of Psychiatry. And the vast majority of our child and adolescent psychiatrists do practice in that and the hospital footprint. It's a great question. There's a lot of work to be able to move some of these other products um, into children. I, I had a question about the psilocybin therapy and um, to what extent, or are you looking at the effects of psychotherapy on those neural connections at this point, like psilocybin assisted mm -hmm. therapies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's, that's an excellent question that, that, that I didn't get a chance to talk about too much in, in my presentation. Um, so currently the standard is that psilocybin is administered in the context of psychotherapy. Um, and so, and so, so actually, like, in, in the studies, all the studies that we're planning, all the studies that have done been so far, there is no such thing as just kind of giving psilocybin without assisted psychotherapy. Um, now the question, of course, is what sort of psychotherapy helps facilitate this the best? Where do we get kind of like the most, the most impact? And also, what is the effect of this eight-hour intervention um, of just psychotherapy without the psilocybin? Um, and these are the things that we really have to answer and that, and that, you know, that myself and, you know, our team and also people across the nation going back to this idea of data sharing, um, some of which who I meet with every month to discuss, um, to discuss how to best do this research are really, are really excited about looking into. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, yeah, the, um, it's, the psychotherapy component is is huge and i um and we have i i should thank them in my, in my talk um i i have two uh, very dedicated therapists right now who who this is basically um all they devote their time to yeah i think we have time for one more question i know that the hand up in the back there has been <laughs> Since the Veterans Administration Hospital is right here on the campus, mm -hmm. do you do any work with the VA? Um, the last resort, last reports that I've had are there's 20 veterans a day killing themselves. So I would think that would be a great potential source of information. Mm -hmm. Do you want to address that? Yeah, I'm also, yeah, I'm a part-time VA employee. I work for our national VA. Office of Rural Health. Um, obviously, suicide and suicide prevention is an extremely important issue. Uh, on this campus is the National VA's Suicide Prevention Research Center. So we have collaborations both within the department in that area uh, on a couple projects uh, looking, and we being one of them. And, and so, and then we have a lot of faculty of the 700 faculty. Uh, many of them are our VA as well, so we're we're working in those areas. Yeah. Well, thank thank you all. I I know we're a little over time, mm -hmm. um, but really appreciate everyone attending. And one last hand uh, for our great uh, panel.